welcome to the Bassa Assembly Conversation Series, presented by Business and Art South Africa. This series explores how cultural intelligence can assist in rebooting the creative economy in South Africa and beyond. Mandy van der Spey, Bassa's Deputy Chair and host of today's episode, Purpose Driven Marketing, unpacks collaboration between creatives and marketers. She is joined by Kathy Berman, Bossa board member and founder and managing partner of Impact Space, which is a catalyst for community-based creative projects, and Lake and Morgan Pikes, responsible for marketing at Bossa member UJ Arts and Culture. Thank you, Sam. Hello, everyone. I'm Mandy van der Spey. Welcome to the latest episode of the Bazaar Assembly Conversation Series stemming from the inaugural Bazaar Assembly, partnered by the British Council and launched in March this year. For those who missed it or want to continue engaging with the content, the Bazaar Assembly online platform is still live and can be accessed at assembly.baza.co.za. This monthly conversation series focuses on cultural policy and investment and the roles of both business and the arts to affect changes for growth in and for both sectors. Today's topic is purpose-driven marketing, specifically within the cultural sector. We explore the roles of creatives and marketers and how best they can work together to achieve the goals of each constituency, corporate and art practitioner, and specifically their impact on and success in reaching their desired stakeholders or communities. Joining us today, we have Lake and Morgan Baikis and Kathy Berman. Welcome, ladies. Please, would you introduce yourselves, Laken? Excellent. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, Team Barca. Um, as Mandy has said, I'm Laken Morgan Bikies, and I'm in the business of connecting the dots in the creative and cultural industry. I specialize in arts marketing, and currently I head up um, marketing at UJ Arts and Culture. So lovely to be here. Thank you. Cassie, over to you. Hi there, um, I'm Kathy Berman, as you've just said. Um, I've got this, what, what some people term a portfolio background. Um, I think I'm just a bit of a wrinkly millennial and that I've always had many, many um, occupations at any one time. I'm currently running a, a small nonprofit called Impact Space, as well as my Africa Contemporary Art and then my all, all my other um, preoccupations and, and, and other organizations. My background ran from journalism through to corporate finance, through to political work, and now back into innovation, incubation, and impact. So for me, impact and purpose-driven work has always been what's kept me alive and driven everything I've ever done. Thank you, Kathy, a lady of many talents. Right, let's get straight into it. To ensure the success of any collaboration between a creative entity and the marketing objectives of a brand or a sponsor, both parties have to understand that the agreement into, entered into has to be a sustainable and mutually beneficial partnership and not a standalone agreement. We need only look at some examples such as the F&B or Joburg Fair or the way, for instance, in which Standard Bank has applied a focused but market segment specific approach in its respective marketing campaigns for the Joy of Jazz Festival versus, for instance, the exhibitions at the Standard Bank Gallery. So, Lakin, in your experience, what is the secret to successful purpose marketing and what should brands avoid when working with the creative sector? Sure, Mandy, to, to, to understand purpose-driven marketing, there really is many avenues, but, but the secret, in my opinion, needs to be authenticity. We just spoke about partnerships and collaborations being a mutual, mutually beneficial scenario. And that has become more and more important for businesses, for creatives to be able to connect in a collaborative sense and the collaboration being the core of it. But for me, fundamentally, the ability for arts organization and brands in general to be able to deliver an authentic experience. We underestimate the audience slash customer in whichever setting you're looking. If the audience slash customer 
feels like you're trying too hard, you're putting on too much of a front or, or really just uh, pretending like this particular subject matter is not important to you, they read it immediately. So for me, the ability for, the, for a said collaboration, which for me is the frontier of, of everything that we're doing now, is the ability to bring what you have, to bring what I have, and for us both to believe in it. Um, people also want to feel like they can relate to the subject matter, relate to the product, relate to the service. Um, if they don't feel that it aligns with their values, their core values, um, it's very difficult for them to be able to buy into whatever you're selling. And for me, audience is my business. Um, but it can be related and can be seen as, as customers, uh, creative product and or service. So authenticity and relatability for me right now, all the trends, all the forecasts are leading that way. People are leading or brands are leading with an empathetic a kindness kind of drive. But if people believe that you are not really into it, if you don't really believe in that, if that doesn't align with what your business is, or and or you as a creative they're like mm, and they see right through you so for me though that's though that's the secret and if you're able to to find that spot you can sell ice to an eskimo in my opinion <laughs> good for you and i'm sure you can too <laughs> kathy you've done some genuinely great work in this area would you elaborate a bit more by taking us through your core considerations when choosing and working with brand partners to ensure a successful collaboration? Well, thank you for telling me the work's great. I mean, I've really enjoyed it and the people who've come on board have really had, had a great time. Um, I think the, the biggest consideration is whether anybody answers my email or takes my call. Um, so, And that really is it because... Um, in essence, um, when I was looking back over the whole history, my personal history and the history of purpose-driven marketing that I can remember, and because I'm so old, I can remember a lot, but or maybe I can remember nothing actually. But the point being that um, that in essence, it's about selling a product to a market. That's it. And that is it at its most cynical point. So if at no point do you align with their current brand mission, vision, values, then they're not even going to take your call. And unfortunately, the brand mission, vision, values stuff alters each year. And you as an outsider are not going to know the most intimate aspects of the organization. And even if you're watching their communications, you might not be able to discern it in the least. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's really a, a crapshoot to, to, to kind of say, where, where, where do you go, if that's the right word, where do you go to find the alignment? And I think what's really exciting about the contemporary era is that we have these endless foundations so it's less a question of making sure that you align with a particular abstruse alcoholic product which in, in essence for me would never align with my values i can at least go to a massive foundation these days or to be absolutely fair to what's happened in this country our most useful source of funding these days is government are the presidential stimulus packages, are the bases of the world. That's where we're finding our funding because there is no value judgment around the values that you're trying to propose, sell, and proactively push. So it's often a lot easier to steer clear of the corporates. Having said that, I mean, I've got 4,000 examples of where the corporates have worked with the arts that I'm sure we'll go into. But for me personally, my most successful opportunities, ironically, have been this year with the presidential stimulus packages because the, there were no criteria around age because I don't qualify. There were no, and, and I, mean, I mean, it's not that I'm alone. I've got groups of people that I work with. But those kind of considerations have to come in when you're the lead partner or whatever other demographic that, that might count. Thanks, Cathy. That again underlines the importance of an artist or a company planning to approach a potential company as a sponsor 
to ensure that they really do understand the current mission, vision, value chain. Otherwise, there's no point in even asking for an appointment. Um, Laken, coming back to you, particularly in the wake of COVID, there's a stronger call for companies to support every possible cause to be the good benefactor. But consumers have developed an acute radar for opportunism with low tolerance for exploitation and insincerity. How does this impact on purpose marketing in the creative sector? I know you've touched on it in your earlier response, but I'm sure you can embroider a bit more. Yes, Wendy. Um, listen, COVID impacted not only our daily lives, but the way that we operate in business and in the creative and cultural industries. So there was this moment of hesitation and this moment of hesitation allowed for an opportunity for people to reposition the way that they firstly see themselves in the world, both as a person, as a creative and, and, and as a business. And that moment, the people that were able to capitalize is a bad word, but to capitalize on the opportunity of giving back of being meaningful in the give back, but to align yourselves with, with campaigns, with people, with groups of people, with aspects of the human nature. So suddenly the human superseded everything else. The idea of what keeps us going, the concept of working together to stay alive, working together to see better days. So suddenly the goals of both the creator, the, of the business, of the society had found a nice kind of juicy moment where they, they could just all be looking towards the same goal. And that for me was quite quite the pinnacle moment because it gave, it gave people the opportunity to champion causes. And again, if you're inauthentic, people see right through you. But the people that were able to champion in a meaningful way are the people that, that got firstly got our attention. And I guess what's what's marketing if if you if you're unable to grab people's attention? So that's what happened. And this there's, there's some interesting examples, and I'm sure we'll we'll start unpacking them. But the people who were able to champion cause were, were able to champion causes, but also able to sell their products simultaneously for me were the true winners. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Laken. And Cassie, coming back to you, building on that, how can you reliably partner with a company or organization that genuinely shares the same beliefs? What sort of conversation would you recommend having up front? Um, well, I think that in essence, that conversation starts playing out over the contractual, the, the, the lines in the contract. And so for both parties, it's what's in it for me, basically. And as soon as you can establish that, the better. Because while I come in with these, or people like me or my organizations come in with these grandiose, wonderful ideas and what we're going to achieve for the brand. And we're going to, you know, we're going to light up Table Mountain and it's just going to be absolutely fabulous. Um, generally, you're dealing with a junior brand manager at times um, who has to adhere to the corporate, the rigors of the corporate environment, not always, but who has to adhere to the rigors of the corporate environment. And it's not about junior or senior, that was in inappropriate, but whatever it is, the, the rigors of the corporate environment are dictating very, very linear um, dictates. <laughs> and so each line of that contract is going to give you the reality. And I find for me, I always want to, I almost, almost have a wish to read beyond that reality and hope that those beliefs and values align totally with mine, but they don't actually, because as, as Lakin has said, the ultimate point is to sell product. So again, when I started looking at the kind of um, brands that are so embedded in the arts currently, and I even look back to the 60s when someone like Rembrandt Art Foundation was pouring money into purchasing art. And then I look at the key sponsors today. It's alcohol and cigarettes, which are con currently constrained with their advertising. So then it's a question of saying, can this in any way align with my personal beliefs, which for me can't, unfortunately, 
But yet, when I look at what has been achieved by these amazing companies, when I look at the accelerators, when I look at our young artists, mainly our young artists, murals and accelerators and things. And I think, wow. So my personal value system has to at some point be put into suspension. So hopefully I land up with a financial services organization or government sponsorship. And then in the clauses, we're very clear about what they're getting, what I'm getting. And generally, we, we, we always feel that we don't get enough back for our bank. Yes, Cathy, but uh, coming back to your comment, re the alcohol and cigarette companies, what about the major financial institutions, the telecommunications companies? Because even in today's climate, uh, where all sponsorship is under severe pressure, they are still the champions of the arts. And they have established a record of supporting the arts and really developing those partnerships with whoever they are sponsoring. Absolutely. So moving from that, because I think they're various sectors, moving straight into the financial services industry. I mean, we can start with Standard Bank has to have been the champion all along because it was not only the, 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 in those days, the Grahamstown Arts Festival, the jazz, the art gallery, etc. There was a wholehearted support. And I mean, Mandy, your history is, is close to that. So I'm sure you could tell us what the vision, mission and values were and how that aligned. But that one only has to look back to NetBank where we saw our first incentives driven campaigns where Dr. Ivan May, who you and I would remember, Mandy came out with sports arts green sponsorship, which now Woolworths has taken to a diff different level. And then we go on to FNB and Investec and all the others who are sponsoring the art fairs. And then the APSA Atelier and Hollard and San, you know, and, and so it goes. So, yes, we've seen extraordinary support for very pure, very pure art in many ways, if I may call it that, for the high arts. Um, I think what's interesting is the move now away from that, where we're now looking at more consumer product support. And that's where we bring in the Johnny Walkers and the Jägermeisters and those kind of things for people like Carabo, Poppy, et cetera. Um, I think where, where, where one which would have aligned for me would have been, and, and now moving back into the consumer support, um, I mean, there are a few that would have aligned for me. I mean, I remember in, and, and now this takes me back a while, but in, in the 1996, when I'd come straight out of activist communication, I joined a marketing company that, uh, well, an ad agency that believed that I had an insight into so-called township communication. We never had a mural in the township and it was never sponsored. And I went and I tried to find sponsorship and tried and tried and tried. Eventually, Yo! TV sponsored the most beautiful murals that were made with nine artists across nine um, provinces. And it was gorgeous and we, we, we brought in young children and, you know, that was one of the first, if, if I may say it. But then I think about Albany, we went to them and today we see what Albany's done with, with, with Esther Mithlangu. And we know that Nike and Converse, etc. those are the new young vital ones. But yes, the main, in the main, the consistent, durable ones were the financial services. And I always used to ask myself, what are they getting out of it? Because switching costs for consumers to move from one insurer or one bank is very difficult. So I think I've got to throw the question back at you. You know, what does the financial service organization get from it? Well, of course, it varies from, from uh, sponsor to sponsor. That can be a whole nother conversation. So I'm afraid we're not going to delve into that right now. I'd like to get back to more Lakin to uh, ask her if any specific examples come to mind that you would like to highlight. So um, obviously, um, for those that don't know, I spent a lot of my time heading up marketing for Barca. So my understanding of how business and arts meet and come together is, is essentially my, my hidden weapon 
And I utilize it because I understand both sides of the coin. And the ability to, or the shift, which is what Kathy was talking about, the shift of brands coming on and like utilizing creatives or the creative and cultural sector and industry for their gain, for their gain. What we've seen is the shift. And Mandy, you alluded to it right in the beginning around the focus on mutually beneficial relationships. Artists are no longer collaborating with brands where they are unable to have a voice, they're unable to have an opinion, where their work is not foregrounded as, as, a, as a, a tool for change. I mean, for me, I, I don't know if you remember it, Mandy, um, APSA did this campaign for the APSA Ateliers in 2014, the blood, sweat and tears. So Bambo Sabia, Diane Victor and Willem Bosov. And that campaign came with these, these three paint, um, these three blocks of paint, these little tubes. And it was made from the blood of Diane Victor, the tears of Willem Bosov. And I thought that, and, and, and the sweat of Bambo Sabia. And, and that for me was such an amazing tool to utilize, not only the fact that it was promoting the Axel Atelier, but it completely personalized the brand, the, the, the sponsorship, the collaboration, which stretched over many years. For me, that was like the first kind of PR drop that nobody actually talks about. APSA and the Latte nailed it in 2014. But for me right now, um, Hollard, which obviously sponsors the Barca Awards, but Hollard's been playing in the space of, of supporting the arts for many years. And they, and they do it without kind of tooting their own horn. So here's me tooting their horn because I think that, they, that they've done amazing work over and above sponsoring things like um, the creative, creative cubes and the, the blocks, etc. over many years, their, their ability to align their marketing objectives through creativity for me is, is groundbreaking. Recently, um, my personal favorite at the moment, and I keep talking about it because it's so exciting, as you drive through Joburg and you look, you're on the highway, the M1, and you're making your way to the south, um, you see this beautiful building in the heart of Joburg, right? Um, a whole lot partnered and they saw an opportunity and this is, and you, they've, they've kind of publicized it and not publicized it, and that's what makes it so special. You know, headed by art champion and brand mama Heidi Brower, they saw an opportunity to inspire hope, inspire change in the heart of Joburg. We're in the middle of COVID. Whoever gets to go to work gets to see this building that has been wrapped by illustrator uh, Russell Abrams, known as, as Yay AB. Um, and it's been labeled the biggest billboard in, in, in Africa at the moment, but it, it has very limited Hollard branding. It has very limited buyout products. It was about the art. It was about the artist's expression. Um, in the interview with, with, with Russell, he speaks about how Hollard came to him and he came to Hollard and they were able to meet each other in a mutually beneficial space. For me, this, this, this thing that was erected just in April, it's such a new initiative, is such a great example of how the artist, and, and for me, the creative is now leading the conversation, whereas with Standard Bank and NetBank and all those kinds of engagements previously kind of led with the business. And that has kind of shifted. And there's the opportunity for business to understand how to capitalize for their personal brand, but to lead with the art, to lead with the power. So I think that that's just for me, like two of my favorites, all time favorite, the, the apps are, but Hollard and team, team Hollard, they just, they, they nailing it. You know what I mean? Thanks. Well, that certainly is a truly impactful partnership between Hollard and the artist. Thank you, Lakin, for your enthusiastic uh, support of such a, a partnership. Now, we've touched on authenticity being key to purpose marketing, and it's clear that consumers want to identify with the brand ethically and aspirationally. Basis Arts Track research found that brands using the arts as their key sponsorship or marketing tool may expect largely positive sentiment from South Africans, and that this could, to varying degrees, increase consumer interest in trust of and likelihood to engage with their brand and its products. <laughs> However, of course, some market researchers say that despite this, 
at the end of the day, price and product are the major factors influencing the final consumer decision. Now, to what extent does marketing a brand through the arts genuinely make a difference in convincing consumers to support that brand? Be it buying a specific product, or even to the extent of changing their bank account or insurance policy. Your final thoughts, Cathy? Sure, it's a difficult one. Um, having been dreadfully deeply embedded in corporate finance and governance and areas like that, where I was after my foray into the arts, where I was now advising people as to how to spend their money um, carefully, how to manage their reputations and all those other risk averse strategies, which don't exactly allow for the abundance with which we approach the arts. Um, it becomes a very difficult conversation because you've got to be able then to prove quantitatively to the sponsor what intellectual um, value um, they're going to be getting, what social capital, intellectual capital, emotional capital, affiliation capital they're going to be getting. Um, and that's a tough one. And then how do you convince the consumer um, who's at the jazz festival? I I'm not convinced by that. I think that the greater good becomes a bigger conversation. And that's what's happened with the whole triple bottom line movement, the whole... Um, all of those movements that have been driven out of the United Nations, your climate change movements, etc. The minute you start incentivizing corporates for doing good, and we've got an incredible regime in this country for tax incentivization, for corporate social initiatives, and all of those things which are sometimes seen as apart from purpose marketing, etc. So once you can prove that there's financial value to the boardroom people, you're winning the game. Then are you winning with your consumer? I, I'm not sure, I don't know. Currently, I think consumers are influenced by influencers. And if Samizi is wearing Nike, do people go out and buy Nike? So I think it's become a very different world with social media and social marketing and Instagram and what I'm gonna call a more narcissistic generation. So you're taking more risks by working with celebrities maybe, who then become your art spokespeople, but by, by working with Carabo Poppy, are you, or with, I mean, as Baz Art have done with D-Bongs, are you genuinely making people buy the product? Well, with D-Bongs, yes, because it's Apple Music. So again, it's whether that product talks to that target market. And that I think is really, really important. And, and just, I have to bring in one other sector which we haven't looked at, which has played into both tech and art. And for me, STEAM is, is the big growth area, STEM and arts. And that's been the huge value that came for, for the very big tech companies like Dell and Google and Facebook, who all put money into early stage accelerators. That then led to the Red Bull type art accelerator and now all of the art hubs and art accelerators that are growing out. And then you're hitting your market as corporate and your market is responding. And of course, you're going to be drinking Red Bull if you're going to be at an art accelerator. Um, I've talked my way all the way around and don't know what, what on earth I responded to you and whether that was of any value whatsoever, but I had fun. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Yes, I must say I do agree that it's far easier to convince a consumer to buy Nike or the music of, of their favorite musician um, than, for instance, uh, switching their bank accounts. And the, the famous ROI, return on investment, is a challenge and will probably always remain a challenge. But nevertheless, it is an important uh, factor in the overall uh, game of sponsorship. Uh, Laken, back to you, your final thoughts. Mandy, it's, 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 it's becoming more and more an imperative for us to, even as artists, to create aspects of focus 
that is centered around the audience, around the customer. By creating products and or services, sponsorship and or collaborations, if we as marketers, as, as people promoting the creative and cultural industries to broader society, cannot put the audience first, put the audience at the center of the, the metric, that for me is the game changer. It speaks to the con to, to, to the, the ideology of impact versus benefit. And as you said, we know the game, Mandy. Auto I, auto I, bottom line, bottom line. That's what it comes down to. But more and more by by shifting the narrative to the audience, selling selling insurance, and that may not be the reason why. Um, Hollard or Standard Bank or, or, or NetBank sponsor the arts, but it will be the reason why we as the consumer sitting at the jazz, enjoying it, uh, inshallah, in 2022, um, we, we will become, we will acknowledge that. And people remember, audiences remember, customers remember the experience. When they've had a positive experience of enjoying Nondo Duzo Makatini at the jazz festival, or, or, or having um, being branded in purple as a mechanism, they remember that. They remember how they felt. They remember uh, what benefit it brought to the people around them. Audiences remember the experiences they've had with creatives and or business. Don't underestimate the audience. Don't underestimate the customer. They need to be the focal point. And irrespective of the digital impact and what that means and how that falls out, of course, we're dealing with we're dealing with a, with a, an influx of trying to keep up with these influences, trying to find ways of, of utilizing marketing budgets, which are constantly changing. Um, metrics are changing, positions are changing, budgets are changing, champions are changing. It is our job within the creative and cultural industries to punch the champions, punch the audience, and bring it all together. If you're able to connect those dots, then we're talking about truly true collaborations and purposeful marketing that actually resonates and returns the investment, which might not be financial always, but eventually it's the long game. If you're able to understand what those moments are, at which phase you are in your partnership, collaboration or product journey, you will nail it. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you. That's so true. And experiential sponsorship is key to any successful long-term relationship and partnership. Ladies, we've come to the end of our conversations. Thank you so much. It's been invigorating, exhilarating, and very insightful. Thanks, Lakin and Cassie. Now, be sure to tune into our next podcast where we explore new strategies towards building a thriving creative sector and share innovative policies towards sustainability at a local and global level. Thank you.